In this video, we're gonna make a web app using Google Sheets as a backend and Tabulator as our interface. So I finally received the 100,000 subscriber YouTube play button. And honestly, this new play button doesn't look as cool as the old buttons used to look. Anyway, by the time this arrived, now the channel has 200,000 subscribers which honestly, I never expected when I started this channel. I wanted to thank each and every one of you for subscribing to this channel. And I want to ask you to help this channel by liking and commenting on upcoming videos. It's not something I enjoy asking, but the reality is that it's the only way this channel is going to continue to exist. The way YouTube currently works, new videos published with 200,000 subscribers get as many views as I used to get when I had 20,000 subscribers. So this video is gonna be long. Usually when I do something like this, I would do probably like 10 part tutorials, but a lot of people have hard time finding different tutorials when I do this. So that's why I'm just gonna put all of it in a single video. So we're gonna build this web app it's gonna have this functionality to load the data from our spreadsheet, like you see right here. We're gonna have options to add records to our existing sheet by clicking add record. And that should add a new record here. We can just go here and type any new information about this. And we're gonna have some of these fields to be just regular entry fields. Some of them are gonna be drop down fields like this, so you can choose. Some of them will be autocomplete dropdowns, meaning that you can basically search in the field and select an option. We're gonna have some checkboxes like this, so we can use. We are also gonna have validation in fields. So for example, if I go to this quantity field and I try to enter something that's not a number or it's not a whole number, it's not gonna let me do so. So I only can do some numbers that are just whole numbers like this and that's gonna go in. And same sort of thing is gonna go with price. It has to be in that particular format. We'll have pagination that goes through different pages. If you have data that goes over a certain number, which you can modify, you can sort these columns by name, quantity, price, pretty much any column you want. And we can also search our records using the search, in this case, using this name column. But again, if you watch the video, you'll see how you can modify this to pretty much do any column you want. And all of that information is going to our spreadsheet over here. And this is that new record I just did. And for those of you who are on a Google Workspace account, you're not gonna have this warning that shows up on top. If you don't have a workspace account, there's a workaround and I'm gonna mention how to do that. And obviously to do all of this, we're gonna use HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and we're gonna use this tabulator to build the grid and make it easy for us to work with our grid. So let's get started. So let's see how we can make that happen. So I'm gonna go ahead and open app script. So name this project and create do get function. And our do get function for our web app needs to return an HTML service. And for that, we'll take HTML service and create template from a file. This needs to be an HTML file that doesn't exist. We'll fill that in in just a second. I'm gonna do evaluate, and then we'll also add meta tags. And here we'll have our responsive meta tags, like viewport and stuff like that. And finally, we need to return that HTML service. So let's create an HTML file. I'm gonna call it main.html, and then I'll go to my file and refer to that file main referring to this HTML. 
So that should be my main structure for this. So I'm gonna leave it at that for now. I do want to get a function to grab this data from the spreadsheet. For now, we'll just do a basic pool of data and then we'll figure out how we're gonna deal with this. So let's create a function, maybe separate it here. I'll create another script file. and call it get data maybe. We'll take our spreadsheet app and get our active spreadsheet. Save this in a variable. And then we'll get the tab, the worksheet. And we're gonna use get sheet by name. And the name of the worksheet in the spreadsheet for this data is called, in my case, customers. So I'm gonna copy and paste that here. Now in this, I'm gonna grab the data by going to this first cell and doing command A to grab this entire data set. And in order for me to do that, I'm going to create another variable called data range. And we'll take that worksheet and point to that A1 cell. And from that A1 cell, we're gonna do get data region. And that should do that control A thing. And at this point, we can get the actual data. And we'll do that by taking that data range and doing get display values. Values, not value, there it is. So at that point, if I do console log of that data, if I just quickly run this so you can see what happens, that should pull this data over here. So let's do that and see what this looks like. So this is that get data function, run. Do all this permission stuff. And as you can see, we got our data as an array of arrays. First row being our headers. Let's quickly separate our headers from the data below. And to do that, we'll add another line here. And we'll take that data and do shift, which is gonna remove the first row in that data and save it in this variable headers. So at this point, if I console.log, headers, and then another console lock data, which is this. You'll see that first headers console log gives me an array of headers here. And then we have the data here separate from that. So, so far, so good. We're gonna come back to this function and make some modifications. But now I'll move to HTML and let's actually go to that tabulator website here and see how we're gonna do this. So I'm gonna go to this documentation section on top and let's try to see, see getting started. We have quick start. Let's click on that, scroll down and we have all this NPM installs, but we're just gonna use CDN here. So we're gonna grab these two lines right here, copy them and go to my project and paste it in here. Now the link to the CSS file, is gonna be here, but the script, I'm gonna move it down here below the body. And then I'm gonna add my own script tag here so we can actually work here. Now the version I got here is 5.2.4. So if you copy paste, you have a different version and you wanna match exactly my version, just change the link to exactly mine. 
and you should have exactly the same version I'm working with, or you can test your luck with newer versions, which can have more features. But if something doesn't work exactly the same way, just know that could be something with a version. So now that I got those imports, let's go back to their docs and scroll down and see what the rest of the setup looks like. So if you look here, they made a div with this ID example table. So we need this. So I'm going to copy that, go to our HTML and we'll paste it in the body. We probably want to use a different ID for this, but for now I'm going to leave it the same. We'll go back here. The next thing they do, see they have this data table with their data. This is that table data they got. And again, for now, I'm just going to copy exactly what they got. Scroll down to my project and just paste it in the script section because this is JavaScript at this point. I will redefine this var as const. Remove that semicolon. Let's go back and see what else we're dealing with. Here we have this next section when they actually create this tabulator object. And then they also define this on click event. So let's just grab all of that, copy it, go back to our code and basically just paste it. I'm just going to align all this stuff. So you don't want messy code because then it's impossible to keep track of what's going on, especially when you have to work in this environment, when you cannot split your code in a very good way. Now, if you're working with Clasp and you can split your JavaScript files, then you're not going to have to deal with it. But here, I'm just going to keep it simple. So remove semicolon there. Then I'm going to indent this and finally remove this semicolon. So, so far I got these. Now, for now, the only thing I'm going to change here is this ID right here. So I'm just going to rename this to data table like that. And then I'm going to match that over here. See this pound this so that pound stands for ID, which is this and data table is this, which we're going to match here. So as of right now, this is not going to use any of our spreadsheet data, obviously, but we want to see if any of this actually works. So I'm going to deploy this app to see what actually happens. So I'm going to go under deploy and do new deployment go over here and do a web app. We'll call it head and we'll use our settings. For me, I'm just going to do only myself, but obviously you could set this however you want to set it. So that's going to give me this dev URL. And if I click on this dev URL, it's going to open it in a new tab. It says meta tag you specified is not allowed. And that's because I did set this meta tag here, but I forgot to actually add those tags. So let's just quickly get those. I'm just going to open a new tab and just search responsive meta tags. Whatever shows up here is fine. I'll just click on this W3 schools, I guess, but this is what I'm looking for. So viewport. So that's going to be the first one. And then this will be our second part. Again, all of that is just a single line, but it's going to push me to the next line because I'm zoomed in. So that's that. Now, we could redeploy this, but we should have our dev link now. So if I go under deploy and see, we have this test deployments and we have this web app, the dev link, I'm going to open that and close the other one. 
will redeploy it once we have something. Now, apparently this is the default look of this that looked different on their tabulator here. I'm going to assume there's probably some template settings you can change to make it look dark and nice looking like this. But for now, I don't really care about the dark look that much. What we should be able to see, however, is that it actually works. We were able to grab that data and we have these columns. Now, the last thing I wanna check, if you remember, there was this part, if I go to this, this trigger when we click on one of the rows. I wanna see if this works, it should alert something, which means that if I go back to this and click on one of these, See, it gives me like row two clicked. And if I click on this one, it's gonna tell me row five clicked. So that works. This works fine. If I click on this, see, we can sort this table. Great. So at this point, let's see how we're gonna be able to load our data instead of loading this. And for that, we're gonna need to do a couple of things. First, we need our data in this format. Now notice the format here is that we have an array and then in that array, we have an object for each row and each row has the column and it has the value that goes right after that. And then we got again, the column and we have the value and so on. Now let's try to get our data in this particular format. So for that, I'll go back to that function, this one, Currently, if I run this, our data is in this format, which is just this array of arrays. So let's convert it to that other format. And for that, we're gonna basically loop through that data and that data would be data variable. And we're gonna map it to a new array. And for each row in that data, which I'm gonna just call it R for row short, we're gonna do some actions. Now, once we map this data, we're gonna get a whole new variable, new array. So I'll just call it JSON data or something, or maybe we should call it JS data, like JavaScript data, something like that. So this is gonna loop through this data row by row. So for each row, we're gonna basically create an object. So I'm gonna first create an object, so I'll call it temp object. And by default, it will be an empty object. So in this object, I have to do all those columns. So if you remember, the structure here is column value, column value. I need to do all these properties with those column names and their values. And in order for me to do that, I'm going to take headers, which are the column names. And I'm gonna loop through those using a for each loop. And for each header, we're gonna set a new property within that object. So I'm gonna take that temp object and set a property with that header like this. And that would be the column name. And we need to set the value. And that's gonna be equal to the value in the position of that header. So this is gonna loop through those headers going like ID, gender, name, state, birthday, company in that particular order. And that's gonna match the positions we have in this row. So the first is gonna be this one, then it's gonna be this one, then it's gonna be this one. And because of that position match, we can basically just add an index to this loop like this and use that index to get the value from the row. So we'll take the row that comes from here, which is this data row and grab it in that position of the header like this. And then finally, we need to return this temp object and that's gonna return that data. Now, let me just console log this so you can see what this looks like. I'm just gonna console log that JS data. I'm gonna comment these two lines and I'm gonna run this so you can see what happens. 
So if I scroll up, you can see now I got this, and then I got these column names like this and their values next to them. Let's see what happens if we have a space in those column names. So for example, if I call this one customer name or something and rerun this. Okay, so we do set the value. So as long as you don't have any duplicate column names, that should be fine. I don't want those spaces, so I'll just keep it simple and have a name like so. Good. So that actually does convert our data to the shape. So let's just push some of these up a little bit. There we go. So we got our get data. I'm going to add a comment that this is the end of that get data function. All right, so let's go now take a look at our object again. So we basically made this. So now we're going to have to use that to build this. And if you look here, basically they create this object and they use that table data variable, this one here as the data when they create this. And then in columns, they set what column name matches to what field. And the field is basically here in this object, what it's called, like name, like let's look at a different example, like date of birth. So see, we want the column here to say like nice date of birth, but here the field is DOB, which is basically this right here. So let's do this. So I'm going to go back and what we need to do, we need to basically call this function to get this data and we're just going to return this data so we can use that data. So now we're not going to console log it anymore. We're just going to return it. Maybe I'll just keep that console log here just in case we need to come back and do something with this. So now because we have this get data function, we should be able to call it in our front end and we're going to have to figure out when exactly we're going to call that for now. We'll probably call it when the page loads. So we'll go back to our HTML to work within our JavaScript here. And we'll add a function here. We'll call that function. I'm going to push all this stuff down a little bit. And I'm going to call this function page load. Let's not forget that it's a function. And we want that function to run when the page actually loads. And for that, we're going to do document add event listener. And this is going to be our event when the page loads and we're going to run that page load function when the page loads this function. Now, when the page loads, we want to, at that point, run that function in our backend that's called get data here. And to run that function, we're going to use Google script run and that function get data. Now this is going to have two methods in it. One of them is with success handler. I'm just going to push them down to the next line like this. So it's easier to manage this. And then there is another one for failed requests. Like so. And each one here is going to accept a function like when it's a success and when it's this. So for now, let's just do a couple of functions here. So I'll do one function on this one and that will accept the data that comes back from a server. I'll just call it JS data. And for this one, we'll do a function as well. And that would be the error message like so. So all of this could be just continuation of the same line. I'm just going to do this so it's easier to manage this. As a matter of fact, I'm going to move all of this to a separate function. We'll just call it function load data. And we'll move all of this code to this function. 
And then within this page load, we'll just call that function load data right here. Just in case we need to do other things on our page load, we don't want to have all that code here. So at this point, hopefully, if this works and it loads our data accurately, here within this brackets, we should have the JS data, which is the data we have coming from our server from this function get data, which is going to be this. which is essentially this table data. So I'm going to go ahead and comment this out. And then when that happens here, we need to then do all of this. What we've done in this portion. So for now, I'm going to move all of that. I'm going to cut this. Go up here within these brackets here and here. I'm going to paste it. Before I paste it, I'm going to add a couple of comments. So I'm going to type the comment and do command question mark or control question mark to make it a comment. Just so I know where this starts and ends, I'm going to paste the rest of this here. And again, I'm just going to align this to keep this organized. So first, I'm going to remove this note here because it's taking too much space or just make it shorter, maybe. And basically here, this table data is going to be this JS data. So I'm going to copy that variable name and put it right in here to have that JS data. Now we do need to match our columns. See, we have like name, name, age, age, etc. So now I'm going to figure out what our column names are. And I did make our column names the same as these. So that's what I'm going to use. So like name, the field is actually name. So I'll match that. This is what we actually see. So we can call this like customer's name or something. But for now, name, name is fine. The next is age here. So here is called birthday. It's not age actually. Oh, actually we have date of birth. Maybe we could use that. So that's birthday and we'll leave date of birth as how it should be. And we need the rest of our columns, right? So, so far I got name and date of birth which is fine, this, this too. Well, let's add gender, state, those columns. So I'm going to do gender. And this is not going to be progress. And maybe we'll get rid of this alignment too. Favorite color. So instead, let's use state. Copy paste this one. Let's also add company. You should have these in the order you want them listed. So now we do have IDs here, which we want to include here somehow. Let's add that in our first column. So that's just called ID. Something like that. So the rest I'm just going to leave as is. Let's see if any of this works so far before we go any further. So I'm going to save this, go back and refresh this thing. And again, it took a second, but it did load the data as you can see. And I got that data loaded in this table. And again, if I do click on one of these, it should Give me this, it says row undefined collect. So we're gonna have to figure out why that's undefined. Let's go back and take a look. So it gets the ID and I assume our ID is uppercase ID. Let's try to change this to ID uppercase. Let's see if that changes that reaction to this. So I'm gonna refresh and click on one of these. 
and then see it gets us the actual ID of the record we're clicking on. That's good. We're going to need that ID at some point probably. But for now, that's good enough. So now let's go see what settings we can change here. So we may want to have like pagination at some point, like maybe after a certain number of records. I don't know if there's a default, but we're going to have to find out. So I'm going to open their documentation. Let's try to find pagination here. Set up options maybe. See pagination. See there's like pagination, then the default is false. So I guess we'll have to set it to true. And then there is pagination size, which would be the number we like. Let's actually click explore and see what it does. Does it give us an example here? So apparently there is a pagination here. Let's click view source and see how that's done. So pretty much the way I thought that would be except that it says pagination local instead of pagination true. Not sure what the difference is, but let's just copy these two. Go to our JavaScript code and here in these options, we're going to have to add those. So I'm going to add a new line here, a couple of new lines, I guess. Let's just align these and I'm just going to set it to true like the docs said to see what happens and we'll do pagination five. So I'm going to refresh this. All right. So it seems like we now have five records and we have page one, page two. See, we can go, looks like we got eight records total. So let's just take a look. Yeah. Nine. And the first one is headers. That's correct. So that's it. Now we got working pagination just like that. Our sort should hopefully work too. Seems like it does. Let's see by date. Uh, I don't think this date sort works. We're going to have to figure out why. Maybe we'll look into that whole date situation later. But now let's try to see how we change the options so we can actually modify one of these records. Uh, actually, let me comment the line that makes this clickable. That's kind of annoying at this point. So I'm just going to go here and grab this block and comment it out like this. Again, that's control or command question mark to do that. And now it shouldn't do that whole thing when I click on this. So now I want to make this gender modifiable. So we can maybe select between male and female. Let's see how we're going to do that. We're going to go back to this and I'm going to assume it's here again. As a matter of fact, let's just go back to the beginning where we had an example on the first page. This one, is there an example on this? Well, we seem to have an example right here. Let's try to see how it's done. So right here, see, they have this gender. It sets the size. It says editor select, and then it gives us this, which are the options of what they can actually do. So that's exactly what we're going to need. So I'm just going to copy width is probably going to be pretty good too. I'm just going to copy that too. We're going to go back to our own code and find our gender column right here. I'm going to add a comma and paste it within this object. Apparently there's too many commas now. Let me just erase that like so. So again, all of that is just a single line like this. So that's our gender column. So let's save this, go back and take a look at this and see if we can still modify this now. Okay. So I can modify that as you can see, but obviously that's not going to do anything here in our data. So if I go and change all of these to female, that should not affect our data at this point. So we're going to want to somehow trigger a function to make sure that this updates. 
when we do this. So let's see if we can do that next. Now to be able to do that, we need to basically grab the ID of the record that was changed here. Like for example, if we change to mail, we want to know that this is the ID of the record. And basically based on that, we wanna go here, find that record in this list and update this gender. So we need some sort of event when that dropdown changes in our list. And for that, let's go and look at their documentation again. Under docs, let's try to find if they have like events section or something. There to see events on the left. So it's probably either cell events or row events. So I'm going to assume that's cell events. So let's open that and see what we got. See, we got cell click, double click. We don't care about any of that. Let's find if there is an option when it's changed. Mouse over, cell editing. It says event is triggered when a user starts editing a cell. We don't want that. Uh, when a user aborts, we don't want that too. Event is triggered when data in the editable cell is changed. I think that's what we need. So we're gonna copy this and go back to our code. And right here, remember how there was that section to add an event handler. I'm just gonna paste it right below. We'll keep the old one too. Now this should work because the variable up here, it's called table and then table on, similar to how it's done here, only now it's on cell edited. So let's actually do a console log here and console log that cell variable that shows up here and see what's in it. Remove this semicolon. So I'm gonna save this, go back, reload this thing. We need to open the console log in our front end. So right click inspect, go to console, clear all of this. I'm gonna turn off this mobile thing. So now I got this console log. Let's go ahead and try to click on one of the cells. Hopefully nothing happens. See, no consoles. Let's try to now modify this. Uh, apparently it says the select editor has been deprecated. Please use the new list editor. Apparently they have a list editor too. So once I changed it, see, it gave me this. Apparently it's an object. Let's see what's in it. We have get. So it says there's a get method on it that has three arguments, E, T, and I. And then we got the cell here, which gives us apparently some information about that cell, including see what the old value was and what the new value is. Apparently now that's male. Now it does say the select has been deprecated. Let's go find out what the list is. I don't know why it was in their docs if we're supposed to use a list, but hey, it is what it is. So let's just search on top of your list. See, apparently it says editor list and then values. Maybe we should just copy this and change that in our code. Instead of this being select, just be a list. Let's see if that's enough. So I'm gonna save this and reload this. Clear this. Let's now again click. This time we don't get that error. If I change to mail, that renders this. Now I wanna see if that also console logs something. Let's clear this. If we don't change it. So if this is female and we open and go back to female again, does it console log again? No. So it only console logs when this is changed. That's great. So now let's try to get the actual information from that cell. So again, if I open one of these, Let's open this object and let's try to see inside of that we have this and then we got the cell and within that cell we have the value 
that it is right now, which is male. Now that's great, but it would also be nice for us to get the ID and maybe this row is gonna get us there. See, we have the row and within that row, we got cells and in that cells, maybe we can get the column we want. See, this is the value of this, but I was hoping I wouldn't have to go with zero index, like saying the first column. I was hoping I could go with column name. So let's see if that's a possibility here. So apparently we have this row and then data, and then we have ID. So that should get us there. So let's try to console log this. So I want to console log this ID and I want to console log the actual value. So let's see if I'm going to be able to get there. So I'm going to go back here and when I do this cell, so basically based on that element, there was this thing underscore cell within that object. Let's see what that gives us. So I'm going to save this, go back and reload this thing. And I'm going to clear this again. We're going to open one of these and change it to mail. So now it logs this. Now within that, we should have this value. So let's console log it on a separate line dot value, which should be the value of the cell after change. And then we should also have the row. So here I'm going to do dot row. And then within the row, we have data. So dot data. And then within that data, we have the column ID. So dot ID. So let's see if these two work. So hopefully this will console log the ID of the record. And this would be whether it's male or female. So I'm going to save that, go back and reload. And let's just clear this and open one of these. So right now this is female. Let's change it to male. And you can see we got the number and we got the actual value. We might also want to get what column was modified because if we have modifications that we do in different columns too, we want to know that this modification was done in this gender column. And for that, let's just go back and console log that cell again and see how we're going to get that. So save this, go back and reload. I'm going to clear this, change this to mail. Let's open that and let's take a look. Apparently we got this column. Let's see what's in it. And then we got field, which is gender. So that's pretty much what we're after. So if we do column field gender, that should give us that. So column dot field dot gender. Oh, actually just dot field, I think gives us the field like this. Yeah. So let's try this finally. So save, go back, reload, clear all the stuff. Now I'm going to change this to mail and you can see how we got this, this, and this. So now we can say if it's the gender column that was modified, then let's go to our data and find this record with this ID and change it to this value. Now first let's add that if statement and say if it's gender, this is what that is that gives us gender. Maybe we'll just store all of these in a variable. And we'll say if that field equals gender, then we're going to do something. And what we're actually going to do, we're going to basically call our backend and update our value. So we need a backend function that's going to accept the ID and the value. 
And based on that, it's going to update our record. So I'm going to go to my backend and we're going to create that function right below this one. So I'm going to do function edit. I'm going to call it gender. At some point, it's probably best to just have a function that accepts the field and the rest. So you can just reuse the same function for all the fields. But right now, we'll just go with editing gender only. We need this function to accept an object. I'm just going to call it props, properties. And those properties is going to be basically the value and the actual ID. And based on that, we're going to have to go search for that ID in this column and find which row that's in. So let's try to search in this column A and find the accurate row number. And the way we're going to do that, we're going to take our spreadsheet. Well, actually, let me just copy these two lines here so I don't have to type them. We're going to take our spreadsheet, then we're going to get our worksheet customers. And in this customer's worksheet, we want to search in our first column. So I'm going to do ws.getRange. And the range is going to start from A2 and go all the way down. So we're going to start searching from here and all the way down here. So within this, we want to search. So we're going to do create text finder. And we're going to search for the ID that was passed here. And that's going to be props.id. So that's from this properties, we're going to send ID here. We don't have that props ID. And the way we're going to pass that props ID is by calling this edit gender function here. So we'll do that google.script.run and we'll call that edit gender function. And we're going to pass an object here, which will be that props. And within this object, we're going to pass the ID, which will be this ID from here, which since it's the same name, I could have just done ID without this, but I'm just going to keep it like this. And we're going to pass the value, which will be the value from here. So that's the way we're going to call that function with these two properties. Now that ID now will be this props.id and then props.val will be the value. So now within this, we're going to do find next and that should search that column and return see the new cell that matches that criteria. So I'm going to call it const id cell matched. So if it does match a cell, it's going to give us that cell. Otherwise, it gives us null. So we'll just say if id cell matched equals null, then we're going to throw some sort of error. And we're going to say no matching record. Otherwise, then we have a cell that matched which means from that cell, we're going to get the row number of the record. And we can get that by grabbing that cell and do get row. So now this record row number should give us the row number in which we're able to find that particular ID. So like six, if it finds this one, nine, if it finds this one, and then once we find the right row, then we need to go to this gender column and modify that cell in that row. And we'll do that by taking our worksheet and do get range. And we're going to get the record in that row, which we just called record row num number actually. So we're going to match this. So that's the row number from this worksheet. And then the column for this gender is column number two here. And I'm going to do dot set value. And then we're going to set that value to the value that was passed here to this props, 
which would be props.val, which is basically this right here. And at that point, hopefully, it will go to our spreadsheet and do these modifications in our spreadsheet. Now, let's try to see if this works. I'm gonna delete this line just to make this a little smaller. I'll go back to my records here, refresh this. So right now, if you look here, we got Monica female, right? And if I go here, obviously we're gonna get Monica female. And then we got Donna female. Let's try to modify one of those maybe. So I'm gonna take Donna and switch it to male. And let's go and see what happened in our spreadsheet. So as you can see, Donna's record was modified by making that change. So now let's go to, apparently there's another Donna here. Which Donna did I do? This one, Donna, the other one is probably in the second, yeah, here. Let's try to change this one too. Let's see if that again works accurately. So as you can see, no problem. Now let's go back and modify Donna's back to female like we should. Maybe we should do something else other than male and female in this column because this is kind of weird. But nevertheless, uh, it works. So we do this. As you can see, it does modify our records as it should. Now we may want to have some sort of message for our users to know that it's saving the record and then the record is saved, something like that, because right now the user doesn't really know even though it happens in the background. But you can see our modification actually works. So I do want to add some sort of messaging here that basically gives us the opportunity to see that it's saving this record and then changes are saved because it doesn't actually happen immediately after we change this. It takes a little bit for this to process and sometimes it could actually fail and we want our user to know. So for that reason, we're gonna go back and instead of just having this edit gender like this, we're gonna add that success and failure within this too. So I'm gonna push this down a little bit we're gonna grab that with success handler. And I'm gonna add it here. And then we also need the failure. There. And again, for each one of those, we're gonna pass a function. Now this first function doesn't return anything, so we'll just do this. And this one is going to get some sort of error. We're probably not going to use that error anyways. So basically now I need some messaging for our users. And for that, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to add a div below the table someplace. So let's scroll up. This is the table. Let's go below maybe or above. It's up to you. I'll just do below. Let's actually just copy the div from above and let's just call it alerts. And now let's grab that alerts ID. So let's define a constant on top here. We'll just call it elements. And then when the page loads, we'll go get that element and save it within that constant. Let's actually make this an object. So right here, we're going to do document dot get element by ID. And the ID of our element is alerts. And we'll just save it in this object. So we'll say elements dot alerts equals that. So what we'll do, we'll just set some sort of text within this div box, right? We'll just scroll down here. So when we do this editing thing, before we do this Google script run, we want to let our user know that it's about to save some changes. So we'll take that alerts and actually it's not value, it's text 
content on this because it's a div. And we're going to set it to saving changes. And then if it's successful here, we want to change it to changes saved. Like this. And if it's not successful, we want to say error saving changes. Now the thing with these messages is that once we set them, they will never go away if we have this the way we have it now. But right now, let's take a look and see how this works. So I'm going to refresh this. And if I go here and change this to mail, see it says saving changes and then changed saved. Apparently didn't type that right. Changes saved. There it is. And if we have some sort of error, it should have said error saving changes, but it's basically just stuck with this messaging, right? So if I go back and change this one, see saving changes again and saved again, we may want this message to disappear at some point. And for that, we're going to do some timeout message to basically clear this thing. And let's create that in a separate function. And then we'll call it here. So I don't need this anymore. Let's get rid of that. I'm going to create a function. Clear alert. And in this function, we're going to use set timeout. And this is going to accept a function in number of milliseconds. So let's first create a function and then milliseconds, like five seconds. And basically after five seconds, it's going to do whatever's here. What I'll do, I'll just pass the element to this clear alert function. And then I'll take that element and I'll make the text content of that element blank like this. And then what we could do, we could use that here. We could say clear alerts and pass this element here and then do that same thing if there is some sort of error message to clear the error. So if I save all of that, go back and take a look, hopefully now we're going to have a situation when we open one of these drop downs, we change, saving changes, changes saved, and then hopefully in five seconds, this is going to disappear and it did. And then same here. Maybe that should be shorter than five seconds. So maybe I'll change this to like two and a half seconds. And that's that we got our form that loads based on our data here. And then we can actually modify the gender information in this form. And as we modify that, it updates on our spreadsheet and we get a notification that that actually happened. All right, next, let's try to see if we can take care of this issue with sorting. So we can sort by this other columns, but this date did not sort. Let's try to see if we get any console log errors. Maybe it appears that we do see there's this not defined error. It's probably some sort of library or something. See, there's this date time date sort. So this is that sorting related. Let's go see their docs again. So here I'm going to search sort sorting data. Let's see. Let's look at date. Dependency required. See, we need a dependency. Let's look and see what this library is. Do we have a CDN here? Quick tour. Oh, 
All right, doesn't look that way. Let's actually try to search the library. And add CDN. And that should work, cdnjs.com. I'm gonna go there. Let's grab this right here. So I'll take this script tag, copy that, go to our project, and let's add it to our HTML right above, I guess, the script tag. So this one will be that date library. So save that. Let's see if that's all we need maybe. So I'm gonna go ahead and refresh and try to sort. I don't think that works. So let's go check their docs again. So once we got the library, then we got an example here, see? So we have this field sorter date, and then we have this. So let's grab all of that, copy without this last bracket, go back to our code and find that field, which is this date. So the sorter was already a part of that. Let's actually put this after this alignment. So I'll comma and paste the rest here. Let's just tab this to align it. So we need to probably provide the right format. So this is the format example here. Now our date format is, where is it? So it's month, day, year, and month and day are single digits. So we're gonna go to our script and we're gonna match it. So it's M and then D, and then four digit year. And we have this forward slashes as our separators. So let's do that, save, and see if that works. So I'm gonna save this, click on this date of birth. I think that got sorted now, see 1973, 83, 86, and then it goes up. So if I go the other way, See, now we start from the lower amount and we go up. And apparently in their sort, blanks go on top. I'm not sure if there's a way to control it by default. And that's probably this align empty values. And it says force empty cells to the top of the table or to the bottom of the table. So I guess we can do this bottom. So let's grab that. Oh, we already had that. We just have to change this top to bottom. So I'm gonna copy this, go back, and right here, instead of top, we're gonna do bottom. And at this point, what should happen, if I refresh, it should basically, hopefully, if I sort, put our sorted dates on top and then empties go all the way here. Okay, fair enough. So that takes care of this date problem. Next, let's see if we can change this to look like a dark table instead of this bright table. So I'm gonna go to their documentation again. Let's look for style, I guess. So there is this section for custom themes. Let's look at this. So standard teams we got. So we got simple, midnight, modern, and site. Is there an example of any of that? Not that I can see. Uh, maybe examples on top here will help us. This is just a regular example, I guess, of different tables, but hopefully there are some template examples too. Oh, there it is. So this is the standard. I guess that's the one we got. I'm just probably zoomed in a lot. Simple one, midnight. So it's the CSS. Should be like that. So that's the dark one. Doesn't appear like the actual black one they got is available. But let's try to see if we can do this. 
we probably just have to change the CSS. So I'm gonna go to our HTML and right here, when we have the CSS import, let's change this tabulator to what that was, like this, and save. And hopefully now if I refresh, yeah, that takes that template. So these are fine. We can probably do our own styles to make it better. But for now, this is good enough. So the next thing I wanna to try to do is to make one of these other fields editable too. So maybe like their names, so we can type a different name and save that in the database. So let's see how we can do that. So first, let's go grab the docs and see how we make a field editable. So I think if we go to the home page here, I think I could see type over it, which basically means that if we look at this example and we'll look at that column name, we should be able to see how it's done. So as you can see here under columns, we have this name field and editor is input. So I'm gonna copy that, go back to our own script, find this name column and add that to this field. And at this point, if we go back and refresh this, hopefully I'm gonna be able to type something here. Yes, I am. Now the key here is again to save that to our spreadsheet because it's not going to. Now let's just quickly take a look at our logs. Clear this. And let's go take a look at that function that we used to use when we actually change this gender drop down. And that was this cell edited. And here we checked if the field is gender, then we're gonna do something. Let's actually just add a quick console log here, just to make sure this actually works on that field too. And I'm gonna do that cell dot underscore cell. Save it, go back and refresh. Clear that. So now hopefully if I go to this field and change it to just Monica, hit enter, see that gives me this console log, meaning there was a change and we get the value Monica. And hopefully if I go in and don't change it and keep it Monica and hit enter, it doesn't give me another log, so it didn't, good. So I think this should work pretty much the same way we did this. So we have the value, see Monica, which is our new value. We're gonna have the row where the data is, and then we have the data where we're gonna get the ID. That's the same, and we got the column. And if we look at that field, it tells us what field it was. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna go back and modify my previous function I did for this in a backend to hopefully work with this field too and then with other fields in the future as well. So for that, what we wanna do here, what we do here, we pass the ID and we pass the value. We wanna add the field as one of the things we pass here, which is gonna be this field up here. Now we're gonna rename this function. So we called it before edit gender. Now we're gonna call it edit cell maybe. And then let's go and rename this function in our server side to be called edit cell. And it's still gonna accept these props now here what we do, we go find that customer and we find our matching record. And then we go to this column two where we have gender information and we update that info. Now that column two is the part that's gonna change. So we wanna figure out depending on the field that was sent, which column do we need to update? And for that, we're gonna do something similar to this, except that we're gonna search in this headers to find which column has the header. Now, as I did this, I've just realized that this actually has a problem 
because I didn't do an exact match here. I just did contains. By default, this text finder does contains. So we want to do this match entire cell true and possibly even make this case sensitive, which is match case. I'm not exactly sure if we should make it case sensitive, so I guess we should. Let's actually do that. So that's a little bit of update to our previous script. So now let's try to search and find that column. So I'm gonna copy paste this line and I'm gonna change the variable name here to column cell matched. And we're gonna search in what I think is row one here. So that's fine. We're gonna do create text finder. We're gonna look for not the ID, but the field that we pass. And it's still gonna be exact match. So entire cell and match case. Now then we need to do one of these checks. So we're gonna say if that is null, then we're gonna say invalid field. And then if we do get a match, then we need to do this. So we're gonna say record row, actually column, not row on this one, column number. And here we're gonna say get column instead of saying get row. And we're gonna get that not from this ID cell, but from this column cell. So that should give us the right column number. And then we're gonna pass that to this. And that's gonna be the accurate column. So if that ends up being gender, it's gonna find the column number, plug it in here. If it's a different column, same thing applies. So I think this should now work for, if not all, then a lot of our fields. So we'll save this. Now I'm gonna go back and update this. So right now this only runs when the field is gender. So let's actually do this for a list of fields. So I'm going to do an array and do gender comma. And this new field was name, if I'm not mistaken. This one. Yep. Yeah. The field is actually this. So that's what I need to match. So name. And then I'm going to do dot includes, which is an array method to check if that list contains that field. So we're going to say if the field that's being changed is in this list, then let's go ahead and run this. And we're going to pass that field to our function. And hopefully that's going to work. So I'm going to save this. Let's test this and see what we got. So I'll go ahead and refresh this. So I got Monica here. Let's change that to Monica Z like this. So it said saved changes. Let's go back and take a look. Hey, look at that. The name is updated. So let's go back and change it to Monica Smith and then maybe change it to John. Smith and change this gender to male. And let's go back, take a look. Hopefully we got it now updated. See male here, John Smith there. Very nice. So we should be able to pretty much apply this to other fields too. So if I want this company to be also one of those cells we can modify, we should be able to do that very easily now by simply going to our script and just add the same editor input thing on this company like that. And then if we just simply add that company field here, like so, just by doing this, I should now have that company cell too that's not read only anymore. So we got all of these. Let's go change John Smith to John 
brown. And let's try to assign company. And let's see if this worked. So I'm gonna go back. So see Google and it's John Brown, excellent. And obviously we can add another one for our states. Hopefully you can see how that's gonna go. It's gonna be pretty much this only here, instead of values being male and female, it will be a list of states, comma separated. So let's actually do that really quickly here. So I'm gonna copy this for the state column. I'm gonna paste it here. And here I'm gonna do some values. And then we need to add the state to our list of states here. I suppose we could also, instead of doing this, we could go through this object over here and then within that object check where we have this editor defined. And based on that, we could say that's a field that's modifiable. And by the way, we need to add this editor to our new state column. Let's make sure the comma is in the right spot. Save this and go back. And if I refresh, now we should have this. Apparently that goes up for some reason and we can't see half of this list. That's interesting. Can we control this? Let's go to our docs and look at our list documentation again. All right, let's take a look and see what we got here. Hopefully we have something that controls it. So determine how to use up, down arrow keys. I don't think that's gonna work. So we probably need to mess around with CSS to fix that as far as I can tell. So if you know how to do a quick fix on this, leave your comment below the video. So what I'm gonna do now is do this autocomplete true thing that I saw here. So we can at least search and narrow it down to an option. So here we should be able to go to the state editor and see this params values is one of them. And we're gonna do a comma here and do autocomplete true. Save that, go back and reload this. So now, even though if I click on this, it goes possibly outside of the screen, I should be able to type like something like this and narrow it down, see to Illinois and grab that and see it's saved now. So let's change this one too. I'm gonna look for Florida, there it is. Grab that, saving changes. So now I should be able to see that John Brown is in Florida state. And that is actually correct. Now, if I reload this page, hopefully that reloads just fine. And it does. So we're able now to modify multiple columns now very easily. Some of them are drop downs. Some of them are drop downs with a search with an autocomplete like the state. And we also can just simply type in a couple of these columns like company and name column. So Jack Brown, that should modify that in our data, just like that. Next, I want to add a couple of other type of fields here. So if we go back and look at their examples, I'm gonna go back to their homepage. See, they have this task progress and they have, for example, this checkbox sort of driver thing. We could also add this ratings, but I think I'm gonna skip that one. But I think based on my examples, you'll be able to figure out how to do that too. Let's look at this task. So if we scroll down, See, we wanna see what's in the column here. So that would be this progress, the second column, and see basically it's a value like 1, 12, 100, 
And I guess 100 would be this one that goes all the way through. So basically, it's just a number. And then if we look at this driver, which seems to be this last one, it says car, and it's either one or it's true or it's true as text. And for these two, it seems to be missing. That's interesting. So I'm going to try true and false for this field, and I'll try this progress from one to 100. So we'll go to our data. And let's add a column progress, I guess, you could obviously call it whatever you want. And here I'll enter some numbers. And let's also add that extra column. And for some of these, let's do true. And let's also try false as a value and leave the rest like this. Let's actually leave one of these blank too so we can see what happens in that case. All right, so now that I got these two columns, my function should automatically grab this. So at this point, we wanna add this progress and complete as a column here in this columns list. And for that, let's actually open their documentation and find progress first. So I'm gonna scroll down and that would be this. Copy, go to our file and right after this field, we'll go to the next line and paste. And this field should match our column name and our column is called progress with an uppercase P here. And then I also need this complete, so let's go check that out. So that would be this driver field. Let's copy that. And again, I'm gonna go to my script and add this. There's already a comma here, so we should be able to just paste it. Now the field for me is called complete. So I'm gonna match that and we'll match the title also to be the same. I'm gonna leave the rest exactly the way it is. Now, these two are editor true, meaning you could modify those. Right now, I'm gonna remove those and maybe we'll change that to true in a bit. So let's save this and go back and reload and see what this looks like. All right, so that seems to work. We got our progress, see like 25, 50, 75, 100, and then I had 510 and then a blank. And that goes to our next page. This is our five, this is our 10, and our blank, as you can see, is empty. Now, these are all unchecked. Let's go to page one. These are also all unchecked. So I was expecting some of these to be true. What I'm gonna do here, I'm gonna try to console log this JS data to see what it looks like. So I'm gonna refresh this and open our console log. And this array is that data. And let's open one of these rows and complete is true, but it's text. And this one is blank. This one is false. So it doesn't actually give us a value true false. It gives us text true false. So I guess based on that to simplify what we do, we should probably use ones instead of trues and falses. So I'm gonna go back and try to modify these truths to ones and false to zero and see what happens. And based on that, if I go and refresh this, see, I got some checkboxes here. So that's good. So now it seems to load those checkboxes. Now let's try to make this checkbox clickable so we can actually change that value. So for that, we'll just go back and do that editor true thing for this. 
So that should now make this clickable column. And then now we wanna add that field to this list of fields. And let's see what happens now. I'm gonna save that, go back and reload. So at this point, if I try to check Donna, let's see if that actually worked in our spreadsheet. So I'm gonna go to my spreadsheet, look at Donna, and it did set it to true. The problem with this is that if I refresh this, it's not gonna be checked because based on our previous discovery, that did not work. Okay, so what I'm thinking we could do, we could possibly check what's the type of the field. Let's see if we get any information about the field type when we actually console log the change. So that, if I open this, let's go under column and see what we get. Definition. Yeah, this tick cross. That would be, I guess, that type of field. So let's go with this logic. So I'm gonna go here and what I'll do when we do this function, let's, in addition to all of these, get what we're gonna call the type of the field. And that was column, dot, and definition and formatter. And then let's actually move this value below these. And we'll basically set this conditionally. So we'll say, if this type equals whatever that was, this tick cross thing, then we're gonna do something, otherwise we'll just leave the value as is. So what we're gonna do, that value is gonna be something like true. So let's take that. And cast it as actually not a Boolean, we need to cast it as a number. So hopefully it will take the true and convert it to one. So then at that point, we'll pass this value here and it will be zero and one hopefully in our backend. Let's try this, save this, go back and reload. So apparently I got all unchecked. So now let's check a couple of these boxes. So now I got Donna and Ronnie. Let's go back and take a look. So now I got Donna and Ronnie see once. And now because these are ones, when we go back, let's convert these true to zero, zero. When we go back and refresh, it should keep those check boxes. Cool. So let's check a couple of more of these, like these first five, and we'll leave these three unchecked. Let's go back and take a look. That works. All right, cool. I'm not a big fan of this whole like red X. Is there any way to not have that? Red X. All right, let's just do tick cross again. There it is. Tick element, cross element. Custom HTML for the cross element, if set to false, will not be shown. Okay, so I guess we're gonna have to set this to false if we don't want that red thing. So I'm gonna go and do that. So I'll go here, find this tick cross. And where exactly do we set that? Formatter params. So we're gonna have to create that. And it's gonna be probably an object. And we're gonna take that cross element and set it to false. I forgot a comma here before I go to sorter. Save that, go back and reload. 
So now I'm going to be able to still check the box or uncheck a box. I just don't have to look at those red crosses. So for ones, this is zero. And I guess if you want that to look like that in Google Sheets too, you should be able to just take this and do some sort of data validation and do some checkbox and then use custom values. And for checked, it will be one. And for unchecked, it would be zero, I guess. And there we are. So now if I go back and check one of these, these check boxes should check and uncheck. So if I uncheck the first one, if we go back and take a look, see it's unchecked here. If I uncheck the third one, that should uncheck that. And then it should also go the other way, but it's not gonna be reactive. So I'm gonna have to refresh to see. But if I, for example, check these, and then I reload. I should be able to see, see the first four are checked and then three unchecked. And then there is another last one checked again. Apparently we got more pages. It is now grabbing those empty rows below here because I did those check boxes which we could filter out from our data by going by ID if we wanted to, or we could just delete these extras like that, and that should take care of that. Okay, so finally we got the task progress going. We got this complete column going. And you have the column size you can set if you wanna change this, like right now, if that state is too big, I could go here and find that state column and add this property to it too. And then set it to something a lot smaller. And if I reload, see that makes that state column much smaller. And you can play around with these sizes and see what you like. So next let's try to modify some styles here. So I wanna get that darker look on this if possible. So let's go to their website and see if we can get those styles and figure out how they set those. So like similar to this, I'm gonna right click on what they've got here and inspect. Let's just scroll up and find their main, this is their table and this is their styles, see background color, that's going to this app.css. So I'm gonna click on that. Here are some styles they set. So I'm gonna try to set those styles. Now this is their table called example table. That's their class for the table. Now for me, that's not what my table is called, but I'm gonna have to adjust. So I'm gonna scroll up and we'll go on top here. We'll add a style container and I'm going to paste that. Now let's add a class to our table here. We could just call it example table, but I guess I'm just going to call it data table, the same as the ID. And then I'm going to pass that here. Now I need to go find what are some interesting styles they set and try to grab those. Tabulator header. That's probably setting the header section, background color. I'm gonna want that. So I'm gonna go back and paste that and change this to data table again. I'm gonna add a couple of more and then test and see if any of this actually works before I continue. So I wanna see if there are any row columns here someplace, there should be some. There you go, row and even, row and then hover. So I'm gonna grab all three of those, go back to our file and paste them. And then I'm gonna adjust the class name to be a data table. 
You could probably just search and replace this instead of doing this the way I'm doing it. So I'm gonna save this. Let's just see if this actually does anything on our table. Hopefully it does. Yes, it did. So we got darker colors. I do need a different header on top here and a different footer. Let's go find where those are set. This is also setting like cell color. We might want to have a lot of these. I'm gonna grab these three too. These are not really footers or headers, but those would be like cell borders and things like that. This seems to be some footer on top here. Let's grab that. And this. So let's check those changes. I'm going to have to replace this example table stuff with data table. So I'm gonna do command F. I'm gonna search for that example table and I'm gonna replace it with data table. When you do this, you wanna make sure you don't have other example tables on a page that it shouldn't touch. So I'm gonna save that. Let's go back and reload. So we got this nicer footer now. See, this part is looking better now. This next, the styling here. There's this green now thing that shows up when we modify a cell. I don't exactly like this background, how it works. And I don't think that's the way it was on their page. Let's move this to the right. So see, if I open this, it has this nice like background and hover effect. This green now, I got that green, but I didn't get that hover effect. I wanna see if we can figure out what particular CSS they have used here. So if I go here, see that CSS here says tabulator underscore site. Let's try to switch to that. So I'm gonna go back to our HTML and remember how we got this midnight. Let's change it to that site. Let's see if that's what they got. So I'm gonna refresh this. Okay, it seems like it is. So we got the backgrounds to work. And if I click on this, it has that nice hover effect. But now I lost all the font colors here. But I think if we go and look at those styles, we could figure out how to get the font color right too. And we should be in a good shape. So I'll go here and try to open this again. Let's move it back to here. Let's try to find where the font colors are. So example table, at some point there's gonna be color instead of background color, like this. Well, that seems to be headers but we should probably use that anyways. It looks like like most of these, we should just actually grab that and put it in our actual file, but I don't want this to become a CSS class. So I just want to basically get the bare minimum done to make this look decent. So let me go and find the font color, hopefully. That could be it. The thing with CSS is that it's so difficult to keep track of what's happening when you're dealing with libraries that somebody else made. I don't see any more, so let me just do search and replace for this example table again. Command F, we got this example table. Let's replace it with this data table. Okay, save that, go back and refresh this. Looks like we got it. So we got our colors now, see, that's much better than what we had. I still don't like this whole pop-up 
situation going up. Uh, let's actually change the height a little bit to make this taller. So if we go back to our initial setup, see this is the height we had set. Maybe we should just change it a little bit. Good, and if you have more records, obviously you want this probably to go much lower than this. So I'll do like 500 pixels for now. So now we got much better looking table and functionality wise, it should work the same way. So let's just see and make sure that actually works. See, it updates the table like it should. If I go here, switch this to female, that should update here to female like it should. So it works now. We have our styling going on. We got our CSS. We have this sorting the way it should. That seems to be fine. All right, so at this point, what we don't have are some number columns. So let's add a couple of number columns and see how we can deal with that. So I'll go back to my data, add a new QTY for quantity column and add some numbers here. Maybe leave some of these blank. Let's now try to add this column to our grid again. So I'm gonna go back and our data should automatically pick it up, but we do need to add that number type of column here. So it's gonna be similar to this input. So I'm gonna grab that name, copy below. We'll name this one QTY. Match that column name here. Input type is fine. And then we need to add this to our list of fields that we wanna be able to modify. So I'm gonna save that. Let's go back and reload and see what this looks like. So that was this, pretty good. I want my numbers to be aligned right. So I'll go back and let's find that field. That was this one. I thought we had some alignments here. See here, horizontal alignment center. So let's add that to this quantity field and just do right instead of center, save that, go back and refresh. Now, hopefully we have our numbers aligned right. So we should be able to go here and add a number and that should save to our table. As you can see, very good. Now, I'm going to assume that this is just a text field right now. So if I try to, for example, enter hello, it will still probably let me do that and that will save it in our spreadsheet. And as you can see, it does. So let's see if we can force this to only accept numbers. So I'm gonna go back to our documentation here. Let's search in the docs validation. So there we go, data validation. Let's open that. And we have this built-in validators, so let's click on that. See, we can do like a required field, unique, so you can read what this does. Now for our quantity, I want whole numbers. So this would be integer, so that's what I want. I'm gonna copy that, go back, and add that to that field, like this, save. If I go back and reload this, we have our numbers, so I should be able to still go and change my number and go back and that should update. Now let's see what happens if I try to type hello. See, I'm trying to hit enter, it does not apply, so it doesn't let me actually save this. So what if I do 3.5? Again, doesn't work because I said integer, so it should be a whole number. So if I do something like 12, then it's fine. So now we have validation built in, in our field. So it's only gonna force whole numbers to be entered in that column. And I assume you should be able to still erase 
one of these numbers and just do blank. And there it is, see, I erased it. And if I go back, that's gone, very good. So that's our quantity field, pretty straightforward. Now let's try to add some sort of dollar amount next, like price next to this. So I'm gonna go back here, add another column and I'll call it price. And we'll enter some numbers. So maybe even apply some number formatting. I don't think we should do dollar formatting here because we don't want to pick up that dollar sign. I think we're going to format it directly in our software, but we'll find out. It's possible we should also remove this comma separator. Let's actually do that. Let's remove all the formats and go with this. And then we'll see how we're going to deal with this. So let's go back and add this field. So what I'll do, I'll basically just copy this quantity and change this to price and price and editor input, alignment right, validator is not gonna be integer. Is there a validator for currency? There is float, there is numeric, valid numbers. So float would be like a decimal point number, but it will not force currency format like two digits. We do have regular expressions. So I guess if nothing else, we could do this. For now, let me just remove the validation. We'll come back to this after we have this field working. Now we want to see if we can format this as currency. So let's go back and search in the search box format. So now we got the cell formatters. Let's go here, built-in formatters, plain text, money. So that should be good. See. This is what we're looking for. I'm going to copy that, go back to our field price, add a comma, paste that formatter. Let's align this a little bit. So that's money formatter and this is parameters. So our decimal is actually a period and our thousand separator is a comma. Our symbol would be the dollar sign symbol after P. I'm not sure what that means, so I'm gonna have to check their documentation. Precision should be two decimal points for currency. Now let's go check what this P is. Hopefully there's some explanation symbol after. Symbol after, position the symbol after the number, default, is false. So I guess this symbol we have like the currency, do we want it after or before? I'm not sure what that P is, but if we want it before, I guess this should be false. So we're gonna do false. So with this settings, let's go back and reload. Actually, we should also add this column in our list of fields that we allow to change. Right there in this if statement. And now we got this new price field, hopefully based on this column. Let's go back and reload and see what happens. So there is our quantity price. That's weird. Did I not put a dollar sign? No, I did this. Of course, let's put a dollar sign in there. Okay, so it did format it. See, like this number, it did add a comma. Here, I didn't have the comma, so it formats our numbers for us here. So let's try to go back and change some of these. So what if I, for example, go to this and add like something like that, I hit enter. So it formatted the number. Now I'm curious how it saves the number in our spreadsheet. 
Okay, it saves as just a number. Excellent. So the number goes to our table with this format after it's saved, but internally the number is just a number. So that's actually good. So we should be able to do this. And again, I guess the issue here is that right now we didn't have any validation. So if I enter this, that will probably save that see in our database. So there's no validation to force for this entry to actually be a price. Even though we do get that formatting. Now let's see how we're going to force that. So based on what I checked before, validation, data validation, there was no money type here. Interesting that there is a formatting money type, but there's no validator money. So where is that regular expression thing? This. So let's try to use this validator. So it says allow string that ends with dot com. So this is basically what dot com ends with dollar sign. What is this? Is this escaping this? in JavaScript string, I guess, probably. So let's copy this validator and see how we're gonna deal with this. So I'm gonna go back again for this field. I'm gonna add it here, I guess, in the beginning of this whole thing. So here, instead of ends with dot com, we still want that dollar sign. So I guess this is the prefix to start regular expression. And this is the actual regular expression itself. So dollar sign means ends with. So we need to force it to end with two characters. So that would be D curly brackets two. So two of this character. And because it looked like we have to escape this, we probably have to double that. So that would be two numbers as last two digits. Now we do need a period before that. So I'm gonna do, again, double this and period. So we need to escape the period in regular expression, otherwise it has a special meaning. So period and digits, and then before the period, we would have one or more numbers. So we would do a number plus, so one or more digits and nothing else. So I guess in the beginning, we'll just do this. So starts with one or more numbers and then period and then two digits in the end. So I think that should work. So let's save this. Let's try how this works. So I'm gonna go back and refresh. So let's go here and try to type hello, first of all, hit enter, doesn't work. Let's now try to enter a valid number. So that went through, that's a good sign. And hopefully that saved, yep, the value, it did. Now let's try to enter something else. So what if we do dot and three characters? See, it doesn't let me, one character still doesn't let me. So if I do two, that's good. So now it lets me do two characters. If I go and add more characters here, that should work, good. And if I try to add like USD or something, it won't let me enter anything else. So basically now we can enter a number in that particular format only. Excellent, so we got our quantity and price working. Let's try to sort this quantity. So that went empties first, then 12, and then 44, then 65. Yeah, I'm not sure about these numbers. We probably have to test it with a different number there too. Let's actually go back and add like 23 and then try to sort. Let's see what happens when we sort. So if I go to my first page, 1, 2, 12, 23, that seems to be correct. So it is sorting my quantities correctly, not as text, but as a number. That's good. And then this way it sorts 
highest to lowest. What about price? So 22.05, 34.56. It looks like it's fine. So let's just add one more. Let's add like 5.34. So hopefully it's not going to go in the middle of this two when I sort. No. So that takes care of our fields. I'm just going to make these a little smaller. Quantity and price. This, let's make it 100. And this, make it 100 too. I think we need to set a size for this last column to be a little bigger so we can actually read the title. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. Let's grab this and find our checkbox here. It looks like it already has one. So let's actually just change this to 120 or something and reload. Good. Seems to work just fine. Oh, and this also got fixed. Apparently, this used to just go up there. I'm going to assume because we made the size of this bigger, the height, it just works now. Nice. Okay, so next I want to add some sort of search functionality on this. So let's try to do something where we can search by name and narrow this list down. So let's go to their documentation and see if they have search. See there it is, search data. So if we look here, it says search rows, as you can see. Allows you to retrieve an array of row components that match any filter you pass in. It accepts the same arguments as set filter function. So let's look at that set filter function and see what it does. So this one is called search rows. It retrieves an array of row components. What about this one? So if we scroll down, set filter, set filter. So there's a like contains string and case insensitive. So maybe this is what we need to actually do, set filter. And it seems like it's done on the table object. And apparently there is a lot more here. You can do multiple filters at the same time as an array. That would be useful if you're filtering by multiple columns. In our case, we're just going to search by their names. So we don't need this array of filters. We just really need a single filter. So I'm going to assume something like this should work for us. So let's go back to our script and open this. Now we need to be able to refer to our table variable right here. We create this table instance. Now we're probably going to need access to that in other spots. So for that reason, instead of doing this const table, let's actually store it within this elements object. So what I'm going to do here, I'm going to change this to be elements dot table. And then I'm going to scroll down and find other table instances like this one. And I'm going to replace it with that elements dot table. I believe that's all we got. Let's make sure everything still works the way it should. But now hopefully we will have access to this elements dot table. So let's just reload this. Looks like we get our results. That's a good sign. So now let's try to apply that set filter to that elements dot table. And for that, we're going to need some place to type our search. So I'm going to go above, I guess, the table and I'm going to make a div. Now inside of this div, let's actually add possibly another div just in case we need one. And then within this div, I'm going to add a label. And we'll do an input element type text. And our label is going to be search, I guess. 
and our actual input should have some sort of ID so we can refer to that. I'll just call it search and maybe we'll add a placeholder. So at this point, I'm gonna need access to this search box. So for that, when we load the page right here, we're gonna do another line like this. So I'm gonna copy this and I'm gonna call this search and we'll refer to that ID search, which I did right there. So now we're gonna have access to that element. And to that element, we're gonna add an event listener. So I'll do it right here. When our page loads, we'll add an event listener. And the event is gonna be input. So when we type in that box, we want something to happen and that something is gonna be running a function. So we're gonna call our function search data. Now this function doesn't exist, so we're gonna have to actually create that function. So I'm gonna scroll down and I'm gonna create that function, search data. That function is going to accept E as an argument, the event. And that should allow us to get what's inside of that box. Now here, what we'll do, we'll apply that set filter function. So if we go to their example here, this is what they had. So I'm gonna copy that, go back and paste. And here, instead of a table, it's gonna be elements.table set filter. This is gonna be the field we're filtering by. That's what it looks like. So if we scroll up, the field we're looking for is this one. It's called name. So I'm gonna match that. And it was called like or something. Let's go check out their documentation. There it is, like, and this would be the value. So I'm gonna go back and that should be like, and this would be the value we're trying to search. So let's just do e.target.value. I believe that should get us what's entered within that search box. So let's see how this reacts. So I'm gonna go back and reload. So you can see I got this type here. I'm gonna click here and I'm gonna search for Jack. And just like that, it worked as I enter. I'm curious what happens if I just erase everything. It actually goes back to our full table, which is exactly how I want this to work. Let's just do another test. So in this second page, we got Donna. And here we also have Donna. Let's search for Donna. So that should narrow down to those. And if we delete D, it should still narrow down to those. So it contains this. We may want to style this search box. Let's try to do a little bit of styling, not a lot. So I'm gonna go back and we're gonna scroll up. We're gonna find those divs I just made. So this is the div that holds the whole thing. So I'm gonna call that class search box outer. And let's add another class for our inner div and we'll call it search box inner. Then we'll have our label and our input inside of this search box. So let's add these classes to our list of classes here. So that's the outer box. This is my inner box. And inside of that inner box, we're gonna have an element input and also input would be this and label here. So let's do a label as well. So for my outer box, which is gonna hold this whole div, I just wanna add some margin below so it's gonna push the table down a little bit. So we'll do margin dash bottom and I'll do something like one rem. Let's try to see what's here on top. So see we have this data table, this background color right here. So I'm gonna apply it to that whole inner 
section like this. We'll add some padding to this too, maybe 0.5 rem. And then for my input element, well, we want the color of the text. So we're gonna need something like this to be that white color. And our label should also have that color. So let's just quickly go back and see what that looks like so far. So as you can see, we got now this darker background, we got this area and we got white text. I want a little space between this and my label. So I'm gonna add a little margin to the right of this label. I'll do margin right. Change the background color for this input. I'm not sure if we want this color or a little more gray color. Like maybe this other row color. Let's try that. So I'm going to copy that and go to our, went a little too far, go to our input. And as a background color, I'm going to use that. Let's save this and see what this looks like now. See, now we have some space here. There's this weird borders we got. Let's get rid of those. And we probably also want to add some padding to both the label and the input box itself to kind of space them away from the border itself. So we'll do it here and here. And for our input box, we want to change the border. Now I'm probably going to use that green sort of border. Let's see where we had something like that. It should be one of their classes here. It could be this. So let's try one pixel solid and that color. Let's go back and check what this looks like. Yep, that's that green color. I'm not sure that 0 0.5 padding for this was actually enough. Oh, actually the problem was probably not the 0 0.5, but the part that I forgot to do the measurement. So let's save that and see if that makes a difference. Yeah, that's more like it. And I'm gonna add a little bit rounded borders here for this search box to finish this. So I'll go back to this border and we'll do border radius. And we'll try something like this. Maybe that's a little too much. So 0 0.3. Let's try a little less, 0 0.2. I guess that's good enough. So you can take it from here, but at this point I got a search box. And if I enter Jack, that should just narrow down to Jack and I can erase this click away and here we go, we got our results. So now we have a proper search box. So finally, let's also add an option for us to add a new row. Right now we can modify our data, but we can't add anything to our data. So the way we're gonna do that, we actually need to add a new ID to our table of data when we click on a button in our user interface. Now, first, we're going to have to create that backend function to actually add a new ID below these IDs. So I'll go back to our script, open our server side functions, and we're going to scroll all the way down and we're going to create a function. I'm going to call it add record. And for this, we're going to need the same spreadsheet and worksheet. So that's the same. So what we're going to need, we're going to need to create a new ID. Now I'm not going to go too crazy about how I create that unique ID. If you want 100% accuracy of unique IDs, I have some videos when you can store your last ID number and go off of that to create a unique ID number. In this one, I'll just get a timestamp and basically just use it as an ID, which should be fine for this. So I'm just gonna do const timestamp. 
And the way we can get that, we'll just do a new date object and do get time. That should give us a timestamp. Now I want to work with that and maybe add some dashes similar to this dash here. For that reason, I'm going to convert it to text. So I'll do to string. So right now, if I just do console log that timestamp, let's try to see what it looks like. So I'm going to open this add record here. I'm going to run that and see it gives us this. And now if I run it again, it should not be the same. See, it's different. So that's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to need to break this number down in two parts. The number needs to be five digits before the dash and the rest I'm going to put after the dash. So I'm going to go back here and to get the part before the dash, let's just call it new ID. We're going to take that timestamp and use substring because it's text. We're going to give it a starting point zero and I need the first five characters and then I'm going to add a dash and then I'm going to add the remaining characters by doing another substring and start from five and grab the rest like this. So at this point, if I look at this new ID, save this and rerun, you'll see we got five digits, dash, and then the rest of these characters. Good enough for me. So that's what I'm going to use as that ID. So instead of console logging here, we'll take that, let me zoom in a little bit. We'll take that WS, the worksheet, and do a pant row. And here we'll pass an array with that new ID. And that will basically add this new line with this new ID right below this. So it's just going to add an ID. The rest of these fields are going to be blank for this, which is exactly what I want. Now I want to be able to work with that ID in my grid. So I'm going to return that new ID right there. So this is going to be my backend function to add a new record and return the ID of this new record. So once we got this, now I'm going to go to the front end and we're going to need a button to click on so we can add a new record. And I'll just use, I guess, this structure. I'll just copy paste that div. And here, instead of search box, we'll do add record box and then do the same for this inner and here instead of a label, we're going to have a button, which is going to basically say add record. And we're going to need some sort of ID for this button, which we'll just call add record, I guess. So now that we got this HTML, let's store a reference to this button. So I'm going to scroll down. See, I have this, I'm going to copy paste and call this add record button. And we'll just do that add record to match the ID of the button that I just made here. So now we're going to have that button and for that button, we're going to need an event listener. So again, we'll copy this instead of search, this will be add record button and the event instead of input will be click. So when we click on that button, we want to add a function and the function it's going to be add record. This function doesn't exist here. We're going to have to make that function. So I'm going to scroll down and create this function. So right here, We'll make this add record function. And what this function is going to do, it's basically going to call this backend function to actually add a record. So we're going to need 
one of those Google script run things. So I'm gonna go back. Let's actually find one and copy paste instead of me doing this whole thing. See, like this is kind of similar to what we need. So I'm gonna copy that, go to this new function and paste it here. I'll just align this like that. I don't need these lines. I don't need these lines. I basically just need this main structure of this. And here we're not gonna pass any arguments. And the function we're gonna have to call here is gonna be this backend function called add record. So we're gonna match that here. Now, when we call that function add record, if it's successful here, it's gonna return that ID or new ID, whatever I called it, which is this. Now we're gonna take that new ID and do something in our front end here. To find out what exactly we're gonna do, let's actually go to their documentation and see how we add a new row to our grid. So I'm gonna go here to search, let's do new row. There's no data or something. Maybe let's call it add row. Okay, updating data, add row. This seems to be good. See, we got this table add row function and apparently it has this true. Let's see what that means. The second argument is optional, determines whether the row is added to the top or bottom of the table. True will add to the top. Otherwise it's gonna add to the bottom. So basically do we need to add that new line in our grid on top or below the whole thing? True is fine, I'll put it on top. You can do false to put it below, it's up to you. But in the end of the day, this is pretty much what we're gonna want to do. So I'm gonna copy that, go to our code and paste it here. Remove the semicolon. Actually, I'm gonna remove this one too. And instead of table, it's gonna be elements dot table at row. And here we're not gonna have these. Instead, the field we have is called ID. So it's gonna be ID with an uppercase I. And just to remind you, that's gonna match this field right here, ID. So that's that. Now, if your field has spaces, you would have to probably do this, but I'm just gonna do this, that's fine. Now, all of these I don't have, so I just have the ID, which will be that new ID, which I pass from here over here. So we'll run that backend function, we'll add that new row here, and then we'll grab that new ID and we'll add it to our grid over here. So first of all, let's see if this works. Just before I do that, let's also just add console log and I'll just say error adding the row. Now you could do instead of this console logs, use what I've done here before where I did this alerts and I cleared them. So maybe you can have below the table, like new record was inserted or there was an error inserting the record. You already have an example of all of that here. So I'm not gonna go over all of that again. I'll just keep it simple like this. So let's see if this works. I'm gonna save it, go back and we're gonna refresh our table. Now we have this add record button. Let's see what happens when I click on it. So I'm gonna click on this. So it did add this new line here. And as you can see, this new ID was inserted on top, which means it should also now happen in our data. So if we go back to our data, see there's a new line here with these empty columns here. And now because we have this edit function, we should be able to work with it, find this ID and fill the rest in. So this should just work as is. I should be able to just go here and add a name for this person.
So basically just add the information. If I go back and take a look, it's done. So just like that, we have a function now to add a record. Let's just style that button finally a little bit to make it look closer to this styling. So I'm gonna go back and add some classes. I'm gonna scroll up. So we have this button already here. We have these few new classes. So I want that same sort of background as I did for this search box and same margin. So I'll just copy this. And for this outer, I'm just gonna do a comma and stack this other one here just to apply the same margin to this one too. Otherwise you could just create another new class below and add your own margins and stuff, but this is good enough. I want the inner box to have the same styles too. So I'll grab this inner, scroll up and comma and do dot that class. So that should apply that same background. Now let's add a button style here. So that would be the button that's inside of this. So we'll basically just add that inner record. And inside of this, we'll have a button. Now for that button, I'll probably apply these same things I did with my label. So like same color text, same paddings, same margins, save this. Let's just take a look. I'm gonna reload this. Okay, I guess we're gonna need some sort of background color for that button too, to be this gray background I did before, which was, I think this. So maybe I should have done these classes here instead of doing the label. So let's do that. Let's replace this with that. So save that the ones we did for our input and reload. Yep, now it doesn't give me that hand when I roll over the button. Let's add a cursor for our button. So pointer would mean a hand for us. So if I go back and reload this, See, now I got a button and it has the style and when I roll over it, it gives me the hand. So now if I click on add record, it adds the record and that should also happen in our spreadsheet. And we could go here and add some information. And finally add one more record. So I got John Doe. I also think I had, see Jane Doe. So now if I just search in this box, it should just narrow it down to those. So our search works, our add record button works. We now have a way to create new records. Now this entire time we did all the work under our dev URL. Now, assuming we're happy with our results, and we want to finally deploy this application. We now will go back to our script editor, go back to deploy, and we're gonna create a new deployment. Now, if you wanna create a whole new link for this deployment, you could do new deployment. If you wanna keep the same URL as the last deployment, you can do manage deployments. I have a separate video covering differences here if you wanna learn more exactly how this works. So I will just go manage deployments. And under this, I'm just gonna click edit and switch to new version. I'm gonna type v1.0.0. Then I'm gonna scroll down and we're gonna have to set the correct account. So if you want only people who you shared your spreadsheet with to have access to this and be able to work on this, then you probably want to switch this to user accessing the web app. So whatever account they use to log in 
that's the account that's going to run the app, which is the one that needs also permissions to the spreadsheet. So you're going to have to share that spreadsheet with that person as well. Now, otherwise, if you want anybody to have access to this, you can also just do anyone or anyone with Google account, meaning they have to be logged into their Google account, but it doesn't matter if it's a specific person, just anyone. So if you do this, this one, then probably you would do anyone with a Google account. So this way it's going to be under their permissions. Or in my case, I'm just doing this for this tutorial. So I'll do only myself. If you're doing this again, like a public thing, you can do anyone at this point. I'm going to do that and click deploy. And whatever URL link I have here, that's my final URL. So if I open that, that will be the web app that I get here. If you have a workspace account, you shouldn't have this top part. If you do not have a workspace account, but you want to get rid of this, you could just embed this as an iframe inside of a different page and get rid of that message. I have a video in my original web app series that shows exactly how to do that. If you want to find out how to do that, but for this, this should be good enough. So I'm going to close. See this dev is when you work, you want to be able to see your changes. You're going to be able to do that. But for me, once this is done, this is my final URL right here for my app. So everything should be working the same way. I should be able to go here and search. I should be able to do pretty much everything else I did, including changing my records. So if I want to go to this John Doe record and change maybe the company, hit enter, that should again modify in my spreadsheet, as you can see, and everything else should work exactly the same way. And that should do it for this video. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe and I'll see you in the next one.